Let's see uh, what they had to say w about each other. Uh, today's matches went great. Um, I did uh, as well as I expected I would do. Roaring Torch goes to the face, and it is Roof Trellin that will progress. Today's games went pretty much uh, as planned. Well, that's gonna wrap it up. So we have ourselves our last quarter finalist advancing through. My next opponent is Roof Trellin. I know he likes to have a lot of fun and play pretty trolly decks. Trey is uh, usually a pretty aggressive player. He likes to bring one control deck to most tournaments, but other than that, he's just aggro. I think the hardest thing going against Rough Trellin is going to be the fact that his decks are not uh, very standard, and I think my weakest deck against him will be my mid-range Shaman, since it's made mainly to be aggro, and I haven't really tested it against decks like his. I plan to counter Tere's aggressive playstyle by playing with a super brick wall defensive playstyle that can't be broken. Welcome back to the desk. My name is Cora, and I'm joined once again this weekend with That's Admirable. We officially have our first player through to the grand finals. It is Hot Meowth in an impressive 4-0 victory over Dude. And uh, right now, we are going to get our second semifinal underway. It is Roof Trellin versus Tare. Now, Admirable Tare has been on this stage before. He made it to BlizzCon in 2014, and Roof Trellin is sort of a new competitor at LAN events at big major tournaments. You know, how do you think that this could play out with, you know, one more experienced and, and one player obviously more inexperienced? Yeah, well, I mean, both these guys have some similar goals in mind, uh, which is just to get back to BlizzCon. You know, we heard, we heard Brian say that he, he spoke to Tare and that in 2014 didn't really appreciate sort of the accomplishment that he really made at that point. And at this time, the gravity of the situation is a little bit more real to him. And, you know, right now, players who have been to BlizzCon twice is reserved for players named Kranich. Uh, Tice <laughs> will be on his way there, and Tere looking to also uh, find his way there as well. So he'll be, he'll be effectively the third person there. But for Roof Trellin, this guy's just passionate about gaming. You know, the, every single piece that you see from him and every time you talk to him, you just get this feel that he really enjoys the game. You know, he, not only is, is it just Hearthstone, he loves World of Warcraft as well. You know, for him getting to BlizzCon is just a, like a big personal accomplishment. It's just something that he's passionate about and really wants to achieve. I mean, it's a dream come true for him. And he has the potential right now to make that dream a reality. But first, he has to get through Tare, the seasoned competitor at BlizzCon. And it's going to be Druid versus Hunter, of course, in the first game. Rift Trellin, a strong start, Living Roots on one, uh, Hero Power on two, a little bit weak. He would have liked to follow that up with uh, something to combine with that Innervate or a Wild Growth, of course. And uh, Tare's hand actually curving out really nicely as well. Yeah, and this, this is kind of an interesting matchup because uh, normally what you see from from uh, the Druid versus Hunter matchup is that the Hunter is typically the aggressor and it is very favored in that in that regard. When you look at Therese Hunter list though, it's it's a little bit different than what I think you would expect from, from most Hunter builds. You know, he's got copies of Freezing Trap in here, which we rarely see anymore. There's a Cloak Huntress in the build. Um, and there's also a Princess Huhuran that's in here as well. And, and, and when you add in a couple of these extra tools, I think it even, it sways the matchup even more than you would expect. I mean, having Freezing Trap and being able to isolate certain Druid minions means it's very difficult for them to get through the board. Now, the one time that's a liability is during a Violet Teacher or a Wisp of the Old Gods or an Anixia push. Yeah, unfortunately for Roof Trellin, he does have those tools to make the tokens. He's running two copies of Wisps of the Old Gods, uh, and we are going to see him play one now, but the old Hunter Wombo Combo Knife Juggler Unleash the Hounds in hand is going to put a quick stop to that. Yeah, that's the other thing to note, too, is so many Hunters have moved away from the Knife Juggler Unleash the Hounds package, and Teray is kind of, you know, this is what we saw uh, so often in 2014 was Hunter relying on these strong builds, and in this situation, it is massively swinging to the board. I mean, Roof Shellen has swiped, but he's suffering such a big loss in terms of tempo and card economy when something like this happens. Yeah, and this is sort of an interesting match up in terms of deck choices for both players. Roof Trellin has some very, you know, interesting deck choices. He has definitely some different stuff. And Tare also, 
Uh, some interesting deck choices. This cloaked huntress in the hunter uh, is a little bit strange, but definitely, you know, not a lot of new additions as far as Karazhan cards in Tare's decks. So definitely a little bit um, older. The zoo deck, I think, doesn't have a single Karazhan card in it. So sort of interesting to see how maybe some newer decks with some newer Karazhan techs and some really interesting choices goes up against maybe a bit of uh, an older style lineup. Yeah, I, Roof Trellin has certainly kind of brought the most flavor, I'd say, out of any of the players here. Um, you know, just a lot of a lot of builds that he just really enjoys. And, and for Tare, this is really, I think, the build that he's looks like he's experimented with the most, yeah. with uh, with Cloaked Huntress and a copy of Barnes in here, and, and then also, again, the Princess Huhuran. Now, I have uh, to, to ask. Activate Death Rattles. Absolutely. Now, if I, I have to ask, because usually if you're running Cloaked Huntress in Hunter, you want to sort of go very full secrets. You want to get as much value out of the Huntress as you can. You know, people are even running copies of Snipe, copies of Snake Trap, and we see Tare only has two copies of Freezing Trap. So what is the value of the Huntress when you, you only have one secret in the deck? So kind of just looking at the way that this Hunter's going to end up panning out, you know, you typically want to do something like a one drop into a two drop into a three drop. If Eagle Horn Bow and Animal Companion are only three drops, it slows that down quite a bit. But if one of them, I mean, he's just, he has lethal here, so <laughs> you know, eventually we can stop Doesn't talking about this. Doesn't even <laughs> what the Cloak Tundras does or doesn't do because that kill command, five damage to face, and Tare is going to close out this game very quickly against Roof Trellin's Druid deck. Uh, you know what? That actually, it, it showcases the power of the Hunter. That's really what the Hunter wants to do in this matchup. So it, not entirely surprising. Yeah, it's mostly about curving out. And when you, the Cloaked Hunter is just fine as a 3-mana three 3-4. Three, when you get to combine it with Freezing Trap, a lot of times you can cement that tempo in your favor. And that's what Hunter's always looking to do, is find a way to keep the tempo they generate. All right, let's get to know the very confident but new to the land stage, Roof Trellin. Why did you all of a sudden want to play in a tournament? Is it a lot different than playing on ladder? To me, it's not really that different. When I play, I want to have fun, and if I'm playing with, in front of a bunch of people, I'm trying to have fun too. What sort of made you switch your mindset over to, oh, I'm going to play in a tournament and try and qualify for a championship? My girlfriend, Michaela, she talked me into it. Like, she saw how good I was doing on the ladder, and she gave me the confidence, and it paid off. What was the experience like of playing in preliminaries? I was really nervous coming in because I didn't really have very much experience playing in other tournaments because I haven't played any, I haven't played any cups. I met a lot of cool people there. A bar was there, we hung out a bunch between the games. We had some nice beef shawarma. Not any trash talk? No. Not telling him you're gonna beat him or anything? No, I'm not, I'm not a trash talker. Okay, fair enough. I'm a pretty enough. nice guy. Coming into this tournament as an inexperienced tournament player, but he seems to have all the confidence in the world. And uh, you know what? He said it himself. He's a nice guy. Not a fan of the trash talk. Wants to play a play a clean game, play a good game, and make friends along the way. Of course, so. that, that is right after he says that he will set up an impenetrable wall yeah. uh, for Tari to get through. You can set up a brick wall, and then when the game's over, break it down and have some more shawarma. Yeah, build, like, you know. Build a wall and make Tari pay for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, game, game number one was, uh, you know, very quick. And it's, you know, sometimes Hunter gets those kinds of draws where you're just, you're not really going to beat it. And certainly not when you when you get the Druid matchup into it. It's just such a weak matchup. Um, you know, it's one of those, it's something that we often see be a big pacing part of the series where if a player gets a good matchup early on, they take it down and then suddenly they're at a big advantage. Yeah, and I mean, the standout turn was, of course, uh, Roof Trellin playing the Wisps of the Old Gods into Tare with the Knife Juggler and Leash the Hounds. And after that, just you know, near impossible for Roof Trellin to come back. But putting that behind them, game number two, Tari is going to be playing his very traditional Zoo Warlock, uh, featuring two copies of Sea Giant and a Leroy Jenkins. And Roof Trellin is bringing out his Nizah Paladin. Uh, this is a really interesting list. It doesn't feature Murlocs, uh, very standard, and he played it at prelims. It performed really well for him. So what do you make of this matchup, Admirable? Well, this is one that's like the Warlock needs to get off to a really strong start and kind of offset the pressure from the Zoo side. And it, this being a sort of a more standard zoo list, I feel like it's typically easier for him to do is, is is land some way to actually counteract the pressure. Now, the one thing that's a caveat to that is uh, Tare has has Forbidden Ritual in the deck. So if all the board clears get used, Forbidden Ritual is a way to reload and potentially make a big push. Uh, and Leroy instead of Doomguard means that the burst potential is a little bit more scary coupled with, with power overwhelming. So Roof Trellin does have to keep in mind his life total over the course of this game. He can't just get too liberal with it and ignore it the entire time. And Tare, 
Uh, you know, choosing to play this Direwolf Alpha, I would be astonished if we didn't see Power Overwhelming here. But he's actually going to Power Overwhelming the Knife Juggler and make a push for damage here, rather than Power Overwhelming the Possessed Villager. And there's two reasons for this. It's partially because he wants to have a bite six around, and the other thing is he understands how important it is to be pushing damage here. But is pushing damage right now more important than actually taking care of your board state? He, he values the two damage from the Possessed Villager over the Knife Juggler, and... You know, in the long run, he's going to be losing potential damage from the knives. So I don't know if that it, it, if it equals out in the long run, or if I, I personally would have valued board state here and the potential for the knives to you know take out something like this recruit. I mean, it is something to look for. Is is moving forward in this game, what that sacrifice the knife juggler could mean in these situations? I mean, maybe he actually wants a couple minions to get on board so we can actually place like mm -hmm. maybe couple a big sea giant turn. Um, but we're getting close to that spot where Tare is going to start, or, sorry, Tare is going to begin life tapping every single turn and trying to begin an assault. And Roof Trellin's hand is so good for tackling that. It's just incredibly difficult for the zoo to you know, even have enough damage in deck to overcome two copies of Forbidden Healing. Uh, even even four healing from a true silver is you know not inconsequential in this matchup. It really can add up. Um, you know, Consecration, we see the Solemn Vigil in hand, which is going to be able to push Roof Trellin even further into his deck to find more of those healing cards and more of that removal. Wow, Kodo is a huge draw right here. I mean, Councilman, oh my gosh, that it takes out the Councilman. fantastic. So M King Boss is the stronger of those two minions, but in certain matchups, the Darkshire Councilman is the one that becomes the real threat. And against a control deck, Darkshire Councilman, Oftentimes, it's not contested by minion pressure on board. It's just it's it's just a 1-5 that continues to grow. And when that card goes unchecked, it is very similar to Frothing Berserker, where a three-mana card can very easily become a win condition. The fact that Roof Trellin not only got to save the option of using potentially a quality Consecration this turn, but that he hit it with a Kodo and now has a 3-5 body on board, Tere is suddenly fighting a very uphill battle. Yeah, and we see the Forbidden Ritual come into Tare's hand, which, of course, is the card that he wants to most combo with that Darkshire Councilman, and now he's unable to. Uh, obviously, we know that Roof Trellin has a quality Consecrate in hand, so the board would not stick around regardless. Uh, but for Roof Trellin to be able to remove such a high-pressure minion off the board and put his own minion on board, which can challenge, it's very, very important for him. It's two Power Overwhelmings he's seen now at this point, too. So a lot of that, that scare from the Leroy Jenkins Power Overwhelming Burst is gone. There's still one copy of Soulfire, uh, but 10 Burst from hand Sans some Dark Peddler shenanigans is about the most it's going to be. Picks up a second Solemn Vigil to go alongside of it, but that is a heavy hand all of a sudden. Yeah, Roof Trellin able to save that equality, though. That's very important because uh, Tari does have two copies of Sea Giant in the deck, so it's definitely something that Roof Trellin needs to be conscious of. Uh, however, he also does have the Aldor Peacekeeper, so really big threat, high attack minions from Tare aren't going to be anything that Roof Trellin can't deal with pretty easily. And those are not strong draws right now. I mean, pressure is pressure, but, you know, we're talking at turn seven. I mean, Roof Trellin's going to start playing Tyrion. He's going to start playing Ragnaros. He's, he's, he's going to find ways to start healing for 20. You need bigger minions than 1-1s one at this point. Is this just a coin Tyrion turn? Oh, absolutely. It's just, just, I mean, what is what does Tare do to this? Look at it with his, <laughs> hit, with his 1-1 one, one minions and... Really wish that he had a third power overwhelming in the deck. Yep, Sea Giant is checked from hand by Roof Trellin with Aldor Peacekeeper. Uh, but Tari, just no real options here. It's play minion pressure and hope it's good enough. Man, I, I can't imagine it will be good enough in this situation. Even though Roof Trellin doesn't have any more AoE in hand, he has access to that Ivory Knight, which can pick up another Consecration. Enter the Coliseum, even, is really effective in this matchup. Plus, it provides health. So Roof Trellin just seems very far ahead in this matchup, definitely in control. He's just got kind of all the tools he needs. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and the rich get richer. Equality Wild Pyromancer combo. Yeah, but th this is a, the kind of game that, that Roof Trellin really needs to have too. He needs to find early uh, disruption to these aggressive strategies and then have big follow-up. You know, the fact that he found two Solemn Vigils on the turn he used Consecration, a, a really big deal. And it kind of being an illustration of Tare's Warlock deck and, and why this was kind of a weakness of a lot of lineups prior to this. It's a very traditional style deck where if, you're, if your high priority threats get killed, you're just not going to win. And I really like this. Roof Trellin decides to just go ahead and heal for 10 this turn. He knows there, there really can't be any way that Tare could deal 18 damage to him on the following turn, but he had the extra mana and 
why play anything else from hand if you really don't have to? You want to get the most value out of your cards that you can. And in this case, 10 health is just going to be enough. He valued the other cards higher. Yeah, Roof Trellin is, is controlling the pace of the game. He's the one completely in control at the moment. And if Tare is going to get through here, it's basically just going to have to be at the mercy of Roof Trellin uh, and, and his hand. You know, it doesn't really have any way to identify the hand range from Roof Trellin at this point. Uh, the deck doesn't really have a strong way to play around it. To the mercy of the cards now. And he, Tare does decide to go for the Reliquary Seeger instead of that third power overwhelming. Uh, and it puts him with, you know, a 5-5 body on board. He also has the second Sea Giant. But Roof Trellin has the Wild Pyromancer equality combo. So that board is quickly going to be struck down once again by the Paladin. Yep. There's no real option here for Tare. I mean, if he's going to win this game, he's just going to have to take the big risk and hope that it pays off. And in this situation, doesn't pay off. And Roof Trellin <laughs> throws out the well met. <laughs> to Tare, you can't help but smile. This one is this one's done. You know what? To Tare's credit, he greets back. He's a good sport, and uh, Roof Trellin just found a favorable matchup, but if he'd drawn his higher end, this is a very high-end deck featuring cards like Eadric the Pure, um, you know, both Ragnaros, Tyrion, Nazoth. If he'd had a heavy hand, this game could have ended up very differently. Yeah, it's fa favorable, certainly, when you draw the, uh, the right disruption tools, but outside of that, it, it can very easily go the other way. And I'm going to guess we're finding ourselves uh, some form of a second Tyrion here with Nazoth. Yeah. That it will be... And at 28, behind Tyrion, and your opponent at four, that's pretty much just it. Tari has no way to clear the board, and Flame Imp will actually just kill him. So it looks like he's going to go out in style. Did find a lethal, unfortunately, not the correct one, and Roof <laughs> Trellin tying up the set at one game apiece. And, and honestly, the Paladin, I think, was a really important win here uh, for Roof Trellin as well. I mean, he's facing down a, uh, you know, a Cthune Warrior deck, which which isn't like the greatest matchup, but mm -hmm. it's not bad either. I mean, that one's going to come down to sort of navigating your tools and making the right spot, but it's still important to pick up a win from what I would consider one of his weaker decks. Absolutely. We already had a few words from Roof Trellin, so now let's get to know the returning Tare and his play style. There's, there's actually been only 31 players that have actually participated at a world championship at BlizzCon, and you're one of them. Uh, do you think your experience in Hearthstone gives you an edge uh, against a lot of these competitors who, for some of them, it's their first tournament? Yeah, I think it gives me an edge in the sense that I won't get so uh, nervous anymore. Also kind of gone through everything before, like dress rehearsals and interviews and everything. So I guess I'm kind of more used to it and it probably won't affect me as much. Uh, talk to me about sort of your strategy when going into a tournament. How do you build your lineup? Where do you start with sort of a deck like, I try different things, I guess. Like, sometimes um, if it's done well before, I'll stick with it. Or if, like, what I've been doing isn't really working, I'll change it up. I kind of moved on from trying to, like, counter the meta. And now I try to kind of, like, play part of the meta. And then if I can find a deck that I feel is really strong, such as Cthune Control Warrior, then I'll bring that as well. So kind of have a bit of a mix of what's, like, really strong right now and what I find personally to be pretty strong. What's your playstyle in a game of Hearthstone? Well, first off, I think Rusty would disagree and say there's no such thing as a playstyle. He's coming around, though. He's coming around. It's usually more, uh, I guess, defensive, and the decks I brought for the tournament aren't really that case. But generally, I prefer like control-style decks where you can play a longer game and um, make more decisions to give you a better chance to win. up this series one-to-one -one with his Paladin win over Tare's Warlock deck. And Tare claims to be a player who really values defensive play. He prefers control decks, but we see from his lineup here, he's taken a, a rather offensive stand, something that Roof Trellin says he's going to have to put up a brick wall to block. Uh, Admirable, do you think that's really, you know, something that says that he's just a very well-rounded player? Or maybe do you think he, what do you think caused him to bring this lineup? I mean, it just kind of speaks to his strength and understanding of the game. You know, players will have to go outside of their comfort zones. You can't just play whatever you want every single time. And you have to just respect the, the idea that certain strategies are just very strong. You know, and historically he's preferred uh, control decks and, and combo decks that, that kind of incorporate that control style in there until you can find a way to turn the corner. And he navigates them very well. I mean, he is an excellent endgame player. 
Um, but he's also an excellent early game player. You know, when you have enough experience tackling these decks, it kind of gives you an idea of what makes him so difficult to play against as well. Absolutely. And all right, going into game number three, it's Roof Trellenge Dragon Warrior uh, with a couple interesting techs. And then we see Tare's Zoo Warlock once again. So really great hand for Tare. Roof Trellenge's hand is, is decent as well. He does not have a dragon to activate the Alex Strauss's champion. And of course, we're missing the ever wonderful Fiery War Axe, which uh, the warrior just kind of always wants to see. Roof Trellenge does have two copies of Bookworm wow. in this deck. Well, that second blood to Icker may be not quite as strong. I, I would like to see him uh, take a little bit more time on that turn there. Um, the first blood to Icker, obviously it's great. Hits an Ar hits an mm -hmm. Squire's Divine Shield and makes a 2-2 here. Uh, the second one I think was was perhaps a bit quick. I mean, his curve is, is pretty set in stone at this point. So if he picks up any five drops or plus, so he just may not have an opportunity to cast it. Uh, but kind of looking at the list, I mean, you mentioned there's some interesting tech choices in here and you're spot on with that. You know, the biggest one I'd say is the two copies of Bookworm that he has in the sixth slot. There, there are no Draconid Crushers in his Dragon build, and that's something that we have not seen, I, I don't think, ever since this deck has really burst onto the, to the scene in Standard. Uh, you know, Bookworm offering the ability to play more to the board certainly is is right where Roof Trellin's style is sitting. Um, and then a Nixia at the top end. It's, it's very, very different, and it kind of speaks to you like where he feels the game is gonna go. You know, he wants to be the controlling player. He wants to try to restrict options. Um, and Tare's deck being sort of that pre karazan build, he's got a lot of tools that are very vulnerable to what's in Roof Trellin's deck. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Roof Trellin wants to, instead of relying on those Draconid Crushers for, you know, a very aggressive early push and then drop a 9-9 on turn six, he really wants to capture and maintain that board presence in the Bookworm is one, one way to do it. It's a six mana 3-6, which is reasonably statted low for the six mana slot, but if you can drop it and destroy something like an Imp Gang boss on your opponent's board, then that's just Star an Trek excellent... Star Absolutely. Knife Juggler behind a taunt. There's a lot of things that that card can really sway in a matchup like this. It's it's kind of interesting to, to watch. It's like the new tools kind of uh, force the older decks to, to adapt to that, to that circumstance. Yeah, and then instead of, uh, you know, capping out at something like Ragnaros and Grom, which we saw in some of the other dragon lists uh, earlier yesterday, which didn't have, you know, that really high-end dragon, he's running the Onyxia. So we've seen some Deathwing, uh, really depending on what you'd like to run in that late-game dragon slot. Do you prefer Onyxia in this case? I, I, honestly, I think the preference is, is up to what you expect to face. And with Roof Trellin, I'm actually surprised he only has really Onyxia at the top end. <laughs> I mean, he strikes me as someone who would, who would want the Onyxia, maybe a Ysera just for own personal flair, you know, have the Deathwing in there. Um, but you know, it's, I think it, most of it boils down to what you expect to face at the end of the day. So with Anixia, maybe more of a nod to uh, to decks that are that are a little bit quicker, and and that's maybe why the Bookworm's in there as well. It doesn't anticipate having the lead, maybe. Absolutely, and the the Dragon Warrior already deals with the Zoo Warlock pretty well, and that Bookworm uh, hopefully will come in handy for Rift Trellin in this case. It'll be interesting to see it in play. And so far, Tari is able to keep up his Warlock aggression reasonably well. He's making good use of that uh, Life Tap hero power to keep up his hand size, but he is running a bit short. That Ravaging Ghoul is a great draw right now. Honestly, this 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 matchup reminds me a lot of kind of the, the old Zoo versus Druid matchup, where Swipe is such a great tool, mm -hmm. uh, but Swipe is one of the cards you don't really want to play until you've seen Forbidden Ritual. It's like it's almost like a game of chicken. Who's willing to play it first? And usually, who's ever whoever plays it first, if both players have the card, is at a disadvantage. Yeah. And in this situation, Tarek has Forbidden Ritual available, and it's honestly pretty strong on this board. But when you're staring down a Frothing Berserker, and you know that Ravaging Ghoul is potential to be there, you're you're kind of not wanting to play it, and that leaves him with weaker options. So in this spot, the Alex Straws champion is really important that it's played here. Tare knows that there's not a dragon in Roof Trellin's hand, so he can begin to identify some of his range here. So if you're Roof Trellin in this case, do you want to hold that Ravaging Ghoul? I mean, obviously you know your opponent has two copies of Forbidden Ritual, but what if Tare is thinking, I, I need to try and bait this somehow. I know he doesn't have dragons in hand. It's possible he's got two high drop minions, or it's possible he's saving something that could really devastate my board presence. Yeah, well, he knows it's not Blood to Icker, because he's seen both of those. Mm -hmm. um, he He's probably pretty certain it's not Finley. He's almost certain it's not Fiery War X at this point. I mean, Ravaging Ghoul's one of the, thing, one of the, thing, the only things it could even be at this point. And the Execute draw here is actually super important because it allows Roof Trellin to clear the board and protect this Frothing Berserker, which is now 13 power. 
And normally you don't want to play Ravaging Ghoul until mm. you've seen Forbidden Ritual, but when you have an opportunity to make such a powerful play, you have to take it. Oh my goodness. And Rift Trellon decides to trade into the Defender of Argus instead of going face for 11, uh, strictly because of buffs. I mean, the Zoo right. deck runs so many buff cards. It's got Dire Wolf Alpha. We've already seen one Defender of Argus, Dark Iron Dwarf. Warax. This is a lot of damage that Rift Trellon can push here. Oh my goodness. So, All right, so, so obviously 15's got... going to face. But is he going to attack a 1-1 one, one, or is he just going straight to the dome again? So he's going to choose to continue to, to uh, chip into the board here. The, with Ragnaros in hand, he doesn't want a wide board presence from Tare. Uh, but he sets him to 14. And a sea giant gets drawn. That is a massive draw at this point. Tare oh now is going to have two sea giants on board. Able to take out this Frawling Berserker, but he's taking 16 points of damage at this point. Yeah, and with the, with the addition of the first Sea Giant on the board, Tari is able to play the second using his full mana amount. He's going to trade into the Ravaging Ghoul as well. Oh my goodness, Rift Trellon has the Ragnaros. He he can hit one of these Sea Giants. I mean, this is about as good as a Ragnaros board gets. Like, oh if he hits a Sea Giant, that means the other one is basically committed to attacking the Sea Giant. Oh. And if he hits Tare's face, oh my gosh, that is a huge draw. Now the Sea Giant will live. Oh my goodness. He doesn't is... even... He doesn't even have to attack Ragnaros anymore. Mm -hmm. He can just push eight, 18 damage to face, can, and the Ragnaros can you, can't kill him. Can you really push 18 damage to face? Because if they, if he chooses not to kill the Ragnaros and the Ragnaros hits Tare's face again, I mean, then Tare's just dead. So it, I, I feel like you have to kill the Ragnaros because you are only at six health. But the fact that you get to keep around both of your sea giants, obviously one of them only at one health. He's, but he's going to attack Ragnaros here. It's because his board position is strong enough. You know, it, say he's in he's in a weirder position where he, he's not going to have time uh, to overcome this. You know, it, he connects for 18 in that spot. Does he just risk a Ragnaros shot and, and end up killing him the turn after? I mean, he hasn't seen Ravaging, or he's seen Ravaging Ghoul and two Blood to Ickers and an Execute at this point. This trade is totally safe. But if he pushes here, he's just trying to set up a lethal on the very next turn. But it's already set up. Absolutely. I think in this case, it is perfectly fine for him to play safe. How does Rift Trellon get through these two minions? Even if he were to Finley get the life tap hero power, draw into some more fuel, th there's just no way to get through two 9-9 nine -nine taunts. I mean... What are we looking at? Old handlock? It's like he just dropped two molten giants, taunted them up, and, you know, and Tare's the them. one setting up the brick wall here. <laughs> it's just, man, it's not there for roof trellin. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can shapeshift and take nine all you want to kill a sea giant, but when a second one is stuck around, it is bad news. And this kind of really illustrating the power of sea giant in these builds. You know, a lot of times we saw players some run one or none of them. Uh, in these in these zoo builds, and the whole point of the build is that, that yes, you do have a failure rate when you draw a clunky draw with sea giants. When you unlock sea giant potential, it's very easy to run away with a game. Yeah, we've seen actually some really very different kinds of zoo warlock decks. Obviously, Hot Meowth's list uh, is is very heavy into the discard lock, and he's got some really interesting choices with. Uh, buff cards in that deck, but Tare just went for the high risk, high reward yep. with the Leroy Jenkins, two Sea Giants, potential for explosive damage I, if he is able. And I don't believe there was a two card combination of cards in Tare's deck that would not <laughs> have presented lethal to him this turn. He needed two minions or two mm. points of damage. Yes. Everything in the build is either minions or, or damage, damage at this point. And so that is a very easy win from that spot. What a game. I mean, the Ragnos came down on a prime board, goes, uh, Goes to face on Tare. It's, a, it's not a mm -hmm. bad shot, but the defender of Argus draw sealed that game. Yeah, it sort of put Tare in check, but the Argus follow-up was able to ultimately uh, capture Tare, his second win of the match. But before we get into game number four, let's take a look at Roof Trellin uh, when he talks about having fun and making friends with others in Hearthstone. You're, you're very expressive when you're playing on screen. Fun. Yeah, I never take anything too seriously. I like to have fun with whatever I try to do. You know, I like to make people happy. If I was able to go to BlizzCon, that would be like kind of like a dream come true because it's something I've always wanted to go to. Like, I feel like if I got there, I could I could win pretty easily. I've played a lot of Hearthstone. I'm pretty much on the top level of, of gameplay. I wouldn't say I'm the best in the world, but I'm pretty close. The way I see it, I go in, win three games, take my cash, at the BlizzCon, I feel like the first match is just going to be the easiest part. I'm not even, I'm not stressing at all about the first match. I got that in the bag. It's a good attitude, it's a good attitude. What inspires you when you build decks? When I play, I want to be having fun. Like, I don't just play to do well. Like, 
And to me, fun is having different games, not always having like the same experiences. I'm a big fan of the RNG elements. When you have the random elements, anything can happen. Every game's a different game. Are the naming of your decks significant? Yeah, um, I named my decks after my friends. Can I be on one of your decks? Yeah. Really? Glad to be. You're a good friend, Tej. Can I build a deck? A deck with my name on it? Yeah. That has to stay a legacy deck for the rest of eternity. It I mean, would yeah. be an honor. name on quite a few deck lists throughout the uh, HCT season this year. Most notably, I think the TJ Zoo featuring Spreading Madness and Yogg Saron, but uh, I, you know, now he has the addition of one of Roof Trellin's deck lists as well. Of course, Tare able to go up two to one in that series over Roof Trellin. And well, I, I just wanted to remind you, I mean, TJ had some critical things to say about Roof Trellin yesterday at the, uh, the analyst desk. Hmm. Roof Trellin said they're not friends anymore. Oh no, they had a falling out already? Oh goodness, TJ. You already you already got your name taken off of that deck. And after Roof Trellin said he was such a good friend. Well right off of that aggro shaman deck he built. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, going into game number four. Tari up two to one over Roof Trellin. It is going to be the Bog Champ Shaman versus Tare's token druid. Yeah, the only player to bring quite this version of a Shaman deck, and it, it is something to behold. I mean, this deck relies on having some, some heavy early game disruption and using some effective ramp like Farsight and, and heavy board sweeps with uh, elemental destruction co comboed with Lava Shock, uh, you know, that, and hexes in here to try to stave off some big threats. Its main goal is to accomplish getting a big threat into play and then finding some way to duplicate it, either through an Ancestral Spirit, which gives uh, the minion Death Rattle resummon it or with a faceless manipulator so the goal here is just to make two giant things by, by kind of cheating the curve so to speak wow and a far side into a faceless faceless manipulator not bad at all for roof trellin now this deck is obviously something we don't see very frequently in competitive play uh, not too common on ladder either but how how do you really line up against this druid deck if you're able to put up those big taunt minions, it has to be very difficult for the Druid to push through them for damage. Yeah, so when you're looking at the Druid build from Tare, it, it's pretty much a traditional Malagos Druid build that you would expect. He does have, uh, you know, no Violet Teachers in this build and, and just topping out the Malagos end. So if, if Roof Trellin can't manage to get an assault an assault going at some point, it means Tare is going to have time to find this endgame stuff. You know, the Yogg Saron obviously can be very effective versus big threats if a lot of spells have been cast. Uh, Arcane Giants, not quite as good in this matchup because there are two copies of Hex and just giant minions on the side of Roof Trellin, but he's got to find a way to get aggressive, and that's why these Mire Keepers here are so important. They deliver this chip damage so that he could potentially set up a Malagos turn. Without that, he can kind of be left floundering around as Roof Trellin just plays big stuff the whole game. Yeah, and absolutely important to note, Tari is already at eight mana when Roof Trellin is only on four. So Tari recognizes that he's going to have to establish an assault at some point before Roof Trellin is able to get up to his own high mana levels and then put up those large taunt minions that simply cannot be removed by the Druid easily at all. And he's doing exactly that. He's ramping very high and he's going to get into those big minions very quickly. Yeah, I mean, you saw him cycle Wrath on uh, the Searing Totem early on. A lot of times you players just hero power it. The thing about it is Tari is looking for situations where he can find Nourish and find Gadgets in Auctioneer. Those are two very important cards uh, to the engine of this deck versus a matchup like this one. He just needs to find the right tools to get the job done. If he gives Roof Trellin too much time, he's going to put together massive turns. But even still, this Bogchamp Shaman also has the potential to heal for incredible amounts with cards like Halazeel the Ascendant and Elemental Destruction, Double Healing Wave, uh, which might be difficult to win the Joust against Tari because the Druid does run very high mana cost minions, but still Roof Trellin has the potential for some incredible healing. Yeah, that's why that burst potential is so important from Tari too. He needs to hang on to Living Roots and hang on to Moonfires so he can unlock that potential in one single turn. Tari choosing to use newer, Nourish to draw. No reason to go for the mana at this point. You know, you're already at nine mana yeah, so Nourish quickly. Is almost strictly a card draw spell on this deck. It's it's fairly rare that you ramp with it unless you just have an extremely strong hand. Um, but yeah, this is like the situation he's trying to create is just find more card draw. And so now the debate here is do you cycle immediately? Do you wait for Fandral? Um, you know, he's trying to look for just bigger and better stuff. You know, he can still draw Azure Drake. Just basically anything that draws cards is what Tari's looking for at this point. <laughs> Yeah, and once again, he does choose to cycle with that Wrath. He's going to take five damage, but 
the Shaman deck doesn't have that burst potential. It has very high attack minions on board, and if you get on board, you'll be able to kill your opponent quickly, but from hand, there's there's little to no burst potential. Right, and here's the other thing, too, it's an interesting note about this, is that players, when they have access to the deck lists, it can give them different ways to play. So Roof Trail in this instance may have not initially gone for Bog Creeper, but he knows that there are no natural copies of Mulch in Tare's build. If he wants them, he's going to have to Raven Idol for them. That is a big pickup, and he doesn't have a ton to, like, to, to combo with it right now. You know, he doesn't want to be using Moonfires in Living Roots again. That's the mm -hmm. Malagos combo potential here. But the Adjacent Auctioneer can find him deeper to those spots. And so it's a matter of resources. Like, where does the investment turn? You might see him use, like, one Moonfire. Um, you know, then he still has two copies of Living Roots and the Moonfire to, to couple with big Malagos damage. But he cannot use too many of those resources. Absolutely. This is exactly what Tare needed. He only has one copy of the Gadgets and Auctioneer in his deck, but he was able to find it through some cycle in the early game. We saw him use that Nourish Wrath for cycle both times, which I feel like is, is rather unusual normally. You, you like to Wrath for cycle when you get the opportunity, but oftentimes uh, in the matchups that we see in competitive play, Wrath is used for three damage. So to be able to cycle in this matchup was very important for Tare. Yeah, sort of like a, a, a minor rule to that card is if your opponent is playing an aggressive deck, you need to keep them off the board, so you have to yeah. If your opponent is playing a slower deck, you need to find your engine, and that's and that's when you cycle wrath. So Roof Trellin facing down a Fandral Staghelm on board. So much potential from that card, especially in this case, you know, in the early game, Nourish obviously is a huge threat, but now that Tari's already at 10 mana, Raven Idol is the potential for some really incredible things to happen. And this is a scary board to be facing down. Suddenly 14 power. So now Tare is put in the position where he has to respond. And how does he get through two Earth Elementals? I think this is likely a Gatsune Auctioneer turn here. He can, he can use Innervate and Swipe to start digging into the deck if he finds some more cheap resources to use. Like you mentioned, Raven Idol, you know, it effectively gives him three cards at this point. He gets to draw and he gets both sides of the Raven Idol. You know, a lot of things can happen this turn. And the, again, one Living Roots expenditure here, I think it's totally normal. If he used this other Moonfire, I'd be pretty surprised. Antari is likely going to be able to play an Arcane Giant at the end of this as well uh, if he is able to pick up another Innervate. With the swipe, it's not going to be possible, unfortunately. But he needs to, there's the Innervate, he needs to keep that board presence. Uh, and right now, he's just looking for Malagos to close out this game. Raven Idol is the last card, too. That is a huge pickup. And my the gosh. second swipe, oh my goodness. And there's the Living Roots that he yeah, used. Yeah, and now that he's got the other Living Roots, that's the thing. Now that he has that other Living Roots, he, he is f kind of free to to play some of the other options, and he's having such an, he's unlocking such a massive turn as well that that influence it, influences it as well. I mean, he's taking out one of these Earth Elementals, he's getting two Arcane Giants on the board. This is a spot where he's deviating from that burst game plan because his turn is so strong. Oh my goodness, Tare has given up both of his Moonfires to be able to play both of the Arcane Giants, and Roof Trellin is overloaded for three mana. He has the Lava Shock, and that would mean that he's able to play both copies of Elemental Destruction. Yeah, he, could, he also has the option to just trade an Earth Elemental and kind of see where it goes afterwards. He's got quite a few options here. I mean, even despite the fact that Terei had such a massively powerful turn, you know, did he show a little bit of disrespect to Elemental Destruction in this spot? And, I mean, that that will kill both of them if he chooses to use the other one. I, I don't necessarily think he will, but... Even just Lava Shock Maelstrom Portal and then trade in the Earth Elemental right. and, and save the Elemental Destruction for uh, a huge token turn, mainly. Uh, there's there's not much potential for that in this deck. So what really can Roof Trellin hit with the Elemental Destruction after this? I mean, it, you know, just another wide board presence, a couple of Azure Drakes maybe. Yeah. You know, Emperor Thorson comes to mind. But something that I'm really fearing for Tare this game is that he gave up so many... Uh, of his damage spells to unlock an Arcane Giant turn. You know, did he need to have an Arcane Giant turn that game? Did he need to have two of them on that turn? He definitely could have waited. Likely the, the following turn he would have been able to play those spells. I think he really just wanted the gadgets and value right off the bat. So I think that combined with the potential to play the Arcane Giants was enough to get him to deviate from his game plan. It comes but at a cost. It's, it's important to note that because he's played so many spells now, that yogg Saron is, you know, at least 12 spells. The Arcane Giants cost zero each. Right, and and here's the thing, though. Did Tare, I'm sorry, did Tare need to find himself in a spot where Yogg-Saron became the win condition? Could he have simply waited? That That's 
it's just it's two different roads. You know, if he waits, what does it cost him? If he uses it now, what does it cost him? Well, we're gonna find out what it ends up costing him. <laughs> and you know, the Emperor Thorson here, it's it's not hitting Malagos, but it is hitting uh, one of his living roots, which means he's able to couple living roots with the the one cost one still left in the build with Malagos. So 14 points of damage available in terms of burst. That may not be enough. All right, and there's the second elemental destruction from Rifchelen, getting a very nice roll on the Tharason and able to clear off uh, the Druid of the Flame with his Argent Squire and just drops down Sylvanas. This is kind of an awkward spot here for Tare, where I think he's feeling like he needs to clear this. You know, Sylvanas is, I think, one of the scarier minions for Druid to face down. It's very difficult to to develop a board presence that either just giving up a lot of value and thus tempo, or just clearing it awkwardly with cards that you don't want to use this way. Yeah, it looks like he's just going to have to clear off the Sylvanas. Moonglade Portal is is nice. It bumps him back up to 30, puts some pressure on the board. The pressure here is the important part. And, and Hogger, okay. That's an interesting one. I mean, this does provide some amount of inevitability for Tare, and so I, I think this is likely to require attention in some way. You know, in Roof Chillin, again, he's seen, he knows the build here. Malagos and Arcane Giants are the top end for this, as well as the Yogg-Saron. He doesn't want to hex here because uh, Malagos, if it survives through a board, the only way that Roof Trellin is going to kill it effectively is with Hex. And Roof Trellin does have two copies of the Hex in his list. Uh, only one in hand and only one copy of Ancestral Knowledge, so not a lot of refill potential, and he is running pretty low on cards. Right, and now that he's used two Elemental Destructions, it means that Tare is free to extend into the board position. He's checking this Doomsayer. The Azure Drake swipe answered the thing from below very nicely. There's the second Living Roots that's picked up. Tare might have enough to, to win this game at this point. All right, so Malagos next turn, double Living Roots. That's plus six spell damage with the Azure Drake on board. Plus the Hogger and two tokens, that's... I mean, Roof Trellin needs some help. Man. The Hogger now has, has... Now it's three minions and it's eight power. It's a great... It's a pretty much the best Moonglade portal you're going to get. And he feels pressure. He's healing waving here. Won't win the Joust. And if he doesn't answer some of this board state, I believe he's dead. All right, so Roof Trellin's up to 26. He can hex... He's not. What I mean, do you? Th here's he has to save it from Malagos. He doesn't have the second well, one. Well, it's, it's made that decision at this point. You know, he could have hexed last turn on the Hogger to try to shut it off, uh, but he chose to wait. And now choosing to wait is going to mean that Tare has dug through almost his right. entire deck. He's got one card left, and that means that game number four is going to Tare. Malagos unlocking the extra 10 damage necessary with these spells to push a win. Fantastic game sense from Tari in this game. He chose to deviate from his plan, which all along was Malagos plus spell damage with those cheap spells to burst Roof Trellin from a high amount of health. And instead, he ended up playing the Arcane Giants, really tried to take the board and win that way. When that didn't work out, he used Raven Idol. He found that burst damage once again and was able to revert back to the original plan, which was really fantastic and ended up winning him the game. All right, so let's get a little bit of insight into Tare's life as a college student and the reason behind choosing his major. Check it out. Uh, you've, you've been around since 2014 in Hearthstone, and everybody this whole time has been pronouncing your name wrong. Everyone's been pronouncing it Tare, and it's all uh, for Dan's fault. I even told him when I uh, was at the qualifier in 2014 for BlizzCon in New York. Both me and my friends specifically like taught him how to pronounce my name, which is uh, Tare, and he still got it wrong. So how'd you say his name again? Uh, for Dan. For Dan. Yeah. Make sure, make sure you guys all call him that okay. until he fixes his mind. Okay. <laughs> Talk to me about your life a little bit outside of the game. Um, outside of Hearthstone, I'm currently a student at CSU Fullerton, and I'm majoring in business. I was originally a physics major, and then I switched to graphic design, and then I switched to business. Do you know why you're so indecisive? It was just, you know, the typical, I guess, don't know what you want to do thing. I figured, like, if I don't know what I want to do, I might as well major in something where, I guess, it doesn't matter too much what you want to do, and you can, you know, make a living and live your life, yeah. You could be an entrepreneur. Tell <laughs> me that director's chair. 
If you sit in this chair, you'll win every single Hearthstone game. Sold. His last shot at being the third player in the history of Hearthstone to make a repeat performance at BlizzCon. Uh, Tari is up three to one over Roof Trellin, and Roof Trellin, I'm for sure guessing, is feeling the pressure right now, Admirable. Yeah, I would definitely have to say so. Now, the next matchup, the next couple matchups could potentially be really interesting. Tari's final deck isn't an aggressive one, it is a C'Thun Control Warrior deck, and the top end in this one is is serious. I mean, obviously the Cthune's in there. Obviously the Twin Emperor's in there. Uh, of course, you're running Ancient Shield Bearer when you're running Cthune Control. But alongside that, he's got a Doomcaller. He's got a Gorehal. He's got a Sylvanas. He's got an Emperor Thorson. He's got a Justicar Trueheart. There's a lot of top end it's in Tare's so build. Greedy. I love it. This is the kind of deck that I hate to play against on ladder because if I'm playing a control deck, this just you get out controlled every time with Brand, Doomcaller, Cthune. It's it's amazing the potential it has. Yeah, and a big part of this is that Tari is excellent at navigating these long games. Now, versus the Druid build, there's really something interesting to note here. Typically, when these token Druids uh, were launching their assault, it would just get checked, and they would run out of gas, and they couldn't do anything about it. There was no Soul of the Forest in Roof Trellin's build, but he's found one from a Raven Idol. That is a critical card to this matchup because the goal is to make a board full of 1-1s and then use Soul of the Forest. It's very difficult for a warrior to remove both of those board states. If that succeeds, Savage Roar's potential is unlocked and that's where he finds his win condition. Yeah, Tare would need some two-card combination. He is running two copies of Brawl, uh, of course, the Ravaging Ghoul, but it's it's just very difficult to remove. So that's looking like what Roof Trellin is going to be going for as his win condition in this match. And you have to sort of do it quickly because if the Cthune Warrior gets in control of the game, then they are going to run away with it. And especially with the Justicar, his armor can get very high. Yeah, so something interesting to note here is that Roof Trellin you know, I mentioned that sort of the general rule is when your opponent's looking to get on board early, you want to use Wrath to, to cut into that potential. When your opponent is playing a slower deck, you want to use Wrath to dig to your engine. Roof Trellin has chosen to Wrath to take care of board presence here. I think this is a spot where he could have very easily sacrificed life total and gone for it. And he's actually just going to Wisps of the Old Gods right now. Roof Trellin says, you know what? I'm going to force you to have it right now. This is a big risk to take, and it is not going to pay off. Four cards in Tare's deck would have checked this this turn. Two Ravaging Ghouls and two Brawls. Has Ravaging Ghoul, and he's got to be feeling comfortable about this. Oh my goodness, that was the epitome of a high risk, high reward play, admirable. Do you think Roof Trellin is in a position that he had to go for it already so early in the game? I, I, I don't necessarily think he was in that position. And, you know, maybe looking at his hand, he felt like he needed to get something going. But when I'm looking at an Innervate and I'm looking at a Soul of the Forest and a Wisp of the Old Gods, I'm trying to find a turn where I can, I can combo those two things together. I mean, he's got two interfates in hand. He had he's using them. all the potential to, you know, maybe just play a little bit more patiently. Uh, but unfortunately, Ravaging Ghoul just puts that Wisps of the Old Gods in check. And he does have another copy in deck, as well as an Onyxia. So that Soul of the Forest is Gore not Howl. going to go unused. What but a draw with the Gore Howl, too. I mean, sorry, it's such a safe life total. He's already got tank up. Where on earth does Roof Trellin find a win this game? I mean, it might literally be just Yogg-Saron at this point. Oh my goodness, and this is so different from the Druid versus Control Warrior matchups from you know, 2015 from last year, because usually, especially if you were playing against Combo Druid, the Control Warrior just did not have a chance to win the game, and now uh, the different varieties of these decks, this Warrior is in complete control. It was a big struggle, and honestly, I even think that versus this version, uh, it's a big struggle for Warrior if Soul of the Forest is included in the natural build. Roof Trellin Raven idled into and found a Soul of the Forest and instead chose to take a big risk. So now he can still find a Wisp of the Old Gods, he can still find an Anixia, but now he's down both Innervates, he's used his Emperor Thoris on. The only way he can couple uh, with, with Soul of the Forest is either if things live on board, which in case you've unlocked the potential anyway, or if you have Wisp of the Old Gods and 10 mana. So. This, he's turned this into a very different style of battle where Tare can just play a slower game and really make the most of it. I have no time for games. All right, Tare choosing to just play the Sylvanas on board. He would have the potential uh, with the coin in hand to save Sylvanas for a brawl turn if Roof Trellin was able to build up that large board state again. But at this point, Tare's in such control that he 
can just remain in a proactive state of play and not even have to worry about comeback mechanics whatsoever. Yeah, it's, it's, I think we're still in for quite a long game, but Tari is quickly getting to the point where he, he'll have so much armor that he's effectively mm -hmm. turned the corner. You know, with, with the copy of Brandon here, I'm curious to see exactly where he he goes with this. I mean, his Cthune right now is only at eight power. So if he wants to start getting buffs uh, from Cthune effects, he has to use one of these. And you'll see him use the uh, Disciple of Cthune right away in order to get Ancient Shield Bearer and the 10 armor on board. So he's going to continue to apply pressure here. And a lot of this is because Roof Trellon has used a lot already and is starting to get low on hands and having weak turn after weak turn. Yeah, and this is exactly what Tare has sort of set up to do with the Sylvanas on board last turn. He's just continuing to push his board state, and Roof Trellon is in a consistent, you know, state wow, to have to gonna respond. Wow, he's going to yog right now. <sighs> All right, this this can't be too many spells, but anything can happen with yog Saron. So let's see what it will be. A Burgle. Hey, preparation. That's not too bad. You can see here. This is a lot of power. <laughs> Uh, that Yogg-Saron's creating. I mean, the senseless demon hands are, are not worthless. I mean, the, sorry, the wordless imps are not worthless at this point either. I mean, they very much can be coupled with power overwhelming. They very much can unlock potential from from uh, power of the wild. And here he gets to, he could have cast Soul of the Forest on this board as well. He could have used the other, uh, he could have just ensured that he kept something here, but he has bigger plans in mind with the Soul of the Forest, which was very clear when he took it. And that's what surprised me so much about the Wisp of the Old God's turn. But now, suddenly, Tare's in, in kind of an awkward spot here where he can handle the board pressure, but he's giving up strong tools to do it, and suddenly Roof Trellon has a ton of cards in hand. You know, in any other case with Yogg Saron, you really don't want to see Sense Demons, but in this case, these are 1-1 one, one worthless imps that end up death rattling into tutus with that Soul of the Forest. It might be just that tool that he really needs to be able to go wide on board presence once again. It's kind of weird that like giant threats one by one are really not that effective versus warrior, but enough little one ones can very easily overwhelm them. Absolutely. They have a really hard time dealing with a wide board presence outside of, you know, Ravaging Ghoul and Brawl. But a lot of the time that forces them to have some awkward turns. And if the warrior has a turn where it gives initiative back to the Druid, then that could spell disaster for Tare. Tare just does have so many ways in his hand to, to answer board states, though. It, it's going to be very difficult, I think, for Roof Trellon to, to really be in this game. I mean, you're going to see an extension here from in some sort. I'm curious when he's going to use the Soul of the Forest, because at this point, I, I don't know when it's slated. You know, he's got some sort of plan in mind. I just it's very hard to identify what it is right now. He could take advantage of it right now. He does Just also right have now. the second Wisps in deck, so waiting I was an option for him. But I mean, this is already, it's its six minions on board. The only thing that would be better would be seven, which is, you know, likely to happen, but take advantage of it while you can. I think this is pretty likely to prompt double brawl from Tare. You know, th this is like the scary turn. He knows that Soul of Force is fetched from Raven Idol. He knows the build doesn't have one naturally. The Anixia would be the next threat, and the Wisp of the yes. Old Gods, of course, would be the one after that that can present that wide board state. And there's still plenty of cards in Roof Trellon's hand. You know, if he leaves the board presence alone, he can very easily die here. So that is, I don't think that that's a realistic option. No, absolutely not. He's at 36 health, which seems very safe, but he does know Roof Trellon plays two copies of Savage Roar. So if you leave this board alone, then, you know, you're you're going to be dead very quickly. He's going to slowly chip away at it here. I think he's trying to find a little bit more resources from his brawl, but I'm curious if he might. Mm. I mean, this is a lot of, so right now it's five. Savage Wars would be, would be 12 apiece. So that's 24, 29, 30 with hero power and coupled with power of the wild, it's 35 points of damage. So does he have enough to, in his 36, if he wants to use the Disciple mm -hmm. of Cthune instead, is 36 damage enough to get this done? A Raven Idol could potentially find another Savage Roar here. Tare is just out of reach of Roof Trellon's burst damage, but that Raven Idol could potentially seal it. He's got six mana used on Disciple Savage Roar, two more on the second Savage Roar, and one on Power of the Wild. How is he going to navigate this? Well, I'm guessing he's Savage Roaring now. I would have loved to see him Raven Idol first. Try to get that second Savage or that unless third this is just, Unless it's just lethal, unless I've just totally miscounted this. Five. 24, 29, 30, 31. I counted 31 damage, I believe. 6, 12, 16. Yeah, it's not quite enough. 
Now that very, being said, Tare is super low on health, <laughs> and he doesn't have a way to extend if he's double brawling, and the minions are outside of the Ravaging Ghoul because of Power of the Wild. You know what's actually really incredible? Uh, Roof Trollin's running Onyxia, so that Alex Strauss's champion could potentially be live. <laughs> well, I, d I don't see a way for Tari to actually live through this board position. I mean, even in a, in a double brawl state here, one of the minions will survive through this. Yes. Second brawl, uh, it'll leave behind um, at least one minion. Mm -hmm. That one minion will have two power, and he won't and have the life to extend to beyond. Wow. Soul of the Forest, so powerful in this matchup. Such a pivotal pickup off of that Raven Idol for Roof Trellin on turn one, even. Now here, he can not he can just live for a turn, sort of, I think. So Bash plus Shield Slam, does that keep him alive? Five, no, even Bash Shield Slam mm -hmm. won't keep him alive. Will Bash plus Tank Up keep him alive? Two, four, six, eight, he's got five. So he does go to power. seven here. Yeah, and there's seven showing, so Tare, Counted the minion damage correctly, and, and honestly, pretty well navigated, showing how many different options uh, were available to him there. But again, Soul of the Forest, it is way, way powerful when you're playing as control decks. Yeah, and you said it. This is very difficult for the warrior to win if the druid is naturally running Soul of the Forest. But in this case, we just get it off of Raven Idol, and it works just as well. So Roof Trallon is going to take his second game in the series. It is still 3-2 to two in favor of Tare but Roof Trellin does have the potential to push back into the series. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of step number one here. Again, I think these, these next couple of games are going to be really interesting with uh, the Dragon Warrior, two copies of Bookworm, and then also the incredibly heavy Shaman build with Ancestral Spirit, Sylvanas, Faceless Manipulator. I mean, there's a lot that Roof Trellin can do to, to create powerful board states. All right, guys, don't go anywhere. We are going to get into game number six of the second semifinal right after this. Number six, Roof Trellin is fighting for his life in this tournament. Three games to two, Tare. Tare is on match point. And again, it's the battle of the inexperienced tournament competitor versus the veteran tournament competitor. Admirable, what do you make of this? Well, it's, it's again, the, two ne the, t the next two matchups are pretty hard to, to really slate here. Uh, Roof Trellin's going to go with Dragon Warrior first. And honestly, I feel like his list could be a little bit better than what you would see from a standard one. You know, the Bookworm, I think, is is a little bit important in this matchup. You know, being able to, to hit a Ravaging Golden Board, having invest into it, uh, being able to, to take out a Bran in a key spot, those are important tools. But that being said, what's the sacrifice he's made for it? He doesn't have Draken and Crushers in the build. So if he gets Tare to 15, he doesn't have an extra 9-9 in the build to actually play. That's something that could be a big cost at that. But the opening hand here, it's, it's pretty strong for both players. Tari's got Execute available. He's drawing a lot of his top end in this matchup. If it ends up going slower pace, that's good for him. Um, but he needs some extra tools to handle this early game. Roof Trellin's going to get off to an early start with Fierce Monkeys, and his top end is already looking, shaping up nicely with Curator and with Rag or, I'm sorry, with Grom already. Yeah, the loss of the Draconid Crusher could be pretty important for Roof Trellin in this matchup. Uh, one way to beat the controlling warrior is to simply outpace it. If they don't have a chance to push board presence and really get that armor up to that safe amount of life that they want to be at, then the dragon warrior can just take this game very quickly. So Roof Trellin is curving out very nicely, but he does need to sort of keep that in mind that he wants to keep up that aggression uh, because in the long game, Tari is going to have the advantage. Yeah, it's gonna go with Ravaging Goal here, a very difficult card, I think, to use this matchup outside of Execute to just get the extra pressure rolling and hope to make the most of it. A Ravaging Goal to return, but Roof Trellin, you saw him thumb over that Black Wing Corruptor, anticipating being able to activate it. Now, there's no Dragon in hand at the moment, but if he finds a Dragon, that is a very strong turn for Roof Trellin. Yeah, it would be the perfect comeback that he needs. He does not find that Dragon. Uh, so Roof Trellin instead going to have to get a little bit creative. He does have other plays, uh, specifically this frothing, if he then wants to trade Ravaging Ghouls. Yeah, that looks like it's what he's going to go ahead and do. Yeah, it's a bit of a slower start here for Roof Trellin, which not the position I think he wanted to find himself in, but still enough, I think, to potentially get the job done. I'd be curious to see how Terry plays this turn. So his turn six is going to become very ugly, but he'll have a Sylvanas on board right now. Um, and it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it's putting Roof Trellin in a really awkward position. He can't kill the Sylvanas with just the Frothing. He has no way to activate uh, the Frothing up to five attack unless he 
puts another minion on board as well. Yeah, I, I like this play from Roof Trello, and I think this is where he needs to be at this point, is just pushing damage. You know, he doesn't have a favorable way to, sh to shut down this Sylvanas. Just hope that this ends up working out the right way. And, you know, when Sylvanas lives, it is a little bit different uh, in terms of whether or not it's a strong or weak turn, because he has Brawl available. But Cthune's Chosen picked up. That could start activating those Ancient Shield Bearers. Oh man, Tari's gonna be able to buff his Cthune above 10 attack and 10 health, which means those shield bears represent 10 armor apiece for Tare. How does Roof Trellin, without the Dragon and Crushers, combat all of that armor gain? It's, I mean, it's gonna be tough. I think it comes down to being able to outvalue Tare, but outvaluing a Cthune warrior deck is is a terrifying prospect. Especially one that runs Gorhowl and Brand Doomcaller along with Tare's the Cthune. just gonna go face. Oh my goodness. Admirable, why do you think that he would do that, especially when he had that favorable trade available into the Frothing Berserker? Does he just not respect Rift Rowan's damage potential? I think it's because of his own hand. I mean, he's got Brawl in case the board gets out of, out of control. He's got Ancient Shield Bearer if he needs to pad his life total. I mean, he's got everything he needs to, to actually start an assault of his own. It's a really unique position. Right, and what is the decision going to be? He's got the brawl, both ancient shield bears, which do represent ten armor. Yeah. But y Curator, this is now such a threatening board from Roof Trollin. Curator also just didn't pick up that much gas. I mean, it did get it did thin his deck so that his draws are on average better. But I think he would have liked to see some bigger cards pulled from this curator. You know, I'm thinking Azure Drake could be pivotal to to getting to that end game position. But here, it's just everything is looking Tare right now. I'm I'm curious how much longer he waits to to brawl in this situation. I mean, he could potentially end with two minions on board from this brawl. Yeah, if the Cthune's Chosen does actually live from the brawl, uh, the Sylvanas, oh my goodness. It's just so, it's so difficult. What is he gonna decide to do? All right, so he, I like this. He yep. trades uh, into the Frothing Berserker, kills off the Curator, and then takes the Corcron, which is gonna allow him to push for four more damage. And get the Emperor Thoros on down. This is a huge turn for Tare. I, I don't know if Roof Challenge can actually win from this spot. And the other thing, too, is Tari just feels totally comfortable going to 15, knowing that there's no Dragon and Crusher in the build. If Roof Challenge cannot capitalize very soon, he's going to start falling out of this game. Yeah, this is not one of the Dragon Warriors that runs in a rage with the Grom. You don't have to worry about that uh, 12 damage burst. But even if he did, Tari's safe at 15 with the potential to add another 20 in his hand. I mean, I look at this and I wonder, I mean, does Roof Trellin have to kill this Emperor Thorson? I mean, giving giving multiple ticks to a deck that runs a lot of heavy cards is terrifying. But can you even afford to is the question. He picks up the steady shot. All right. So that is a little bit of aggression. I mean, he's, he, I, I mean, he's playing for tempo at this point. He wants to try to get the game done with. And with the Grom in hand, He's playing to the win condition of drawing blood to Icar and hoping he can deliver that final blow, but Tare is going to start shutting this down. All right, Tare can't potentially double his health this turn, uh, but he also wants to deal with this board, so how does he do it most efficiently while staying out of range of Roof Trellin's Grom? He has the Brawl available for an easy minion clear, but I, f I feel like you're not really opposed to trading at this point. I, I'm just trying to figure out a way he loses from here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, we want to give Rift Trellin the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he'll figure out something. It's a second Ember of Thoris on activation. Brawl's three mana. Eight mana Cthune. It's pretty good. There's Blood to Icar as well. I mean, he was so close to... I mean, he was on the right idea for his game plan here. He does now decide to kill the Emperor, but leaves the Shield Bearer up, and Tare just has everything that he needs. He has removal, he has armor gain, he has direct damage. <sighs> Rift Trellin has none of that. I'm trying to go wide on board here again, just try to squeeze out damage and make the most of this, but Tare's just going to continue to to cut to the board position here. With Doomcaller in hand, he's, he's even free to play this Cthune if he really wanted to but he's just got so many good options that I don't really see a reason to do. He's actually just gonna play Doomcaller. Yeah, I like it. it. It buffs your Cthune for plus two, plus two, and a 10-10 Cthune is not super threatening. 12-12 Cthune's still not the best, but when you have, you know, two large minions on board as well, that might just be enough to shut out the game. 
Yeah, that's, that's a lot of what he's thinking about here, too, is that once you get to this stage, and, you know, a lot of the Dragon Warrior matchup is just a, 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 a stat battle. Like, who can put the biggest stuff on board and, and continue to deliver value trades? Right now, that's Tare. Really interesting, because Tare's warrior choice was, well, for one, the only Cthune deck in the entire tournament, and for two, just a really different kind of warrior than we're used to seeing. Every other warrior was dragon except for Monsanto's combo warrior. Boone here is, if it doesn't kill the Frothing Berserker, maybe there's hope, but it's gonna shut that down. I, Roof Jalen cannot win this game. He does not have a copy of Deathwing in the build. He currently only has one way to activate Execute. Tare is, is extending close to the beyond 30 point and has plenty more in the hand, and now he's facing down 19 points of damage as well. Tare has lethal on board. Can Roof Trellin wow. do anything to stop it? Uh, he can kill the Doom Caller. So, so he now, can sort of stop it. Temporarily, but in the long run, it's just not going to be possible for Roof Trellin. Tare simply built up a brick wall of aggression that Roof Trellin could <laughs> not break down Two as much as he wanted to. Available as well if he wants to play the Beckoner of Evil. It's going to be the Ancient Shield Bearer just to put the biggest stuff on board possible. And Roof Trellin once again under the gun and with very little ways to actually draw multiple cards and play them. I do not believe we're going to be seeing him extended much longer. One extra turn available. <laughs> he can live again. But 42 health for Tare and Rift Trellin sitting at only seven. He decides to trade, wants to force that shield bear off the board, and the execute won't even allow Rift Trellin to do that. At one, facing down multiple minions. No hero power to extend the life. Nothing in hand available to stop this. Tare has had a wonderful performance in this match and showing the power of the C'Thun Warrior deck when it gets plenty of time. Yep, this is checkmate. Tare is going to take game number four and he is going to be the second player headed into the finals of the America's Summer Championship. Potentially, Tare could be a repeat competitor at BlizzCon. Yeah, one match away at this point for Tare to uh, to cement himself there. Tice, of course, was uh, effectively the second player to do it, uh, winning a championship earlier this year, but just a fantastic performance from Tare, and his lineup has been, it's been, it's not been letting him down, that's for sure. Absolutely. We have an interview with Frodan and Tare, our second player, heading to the finals. Thank you very much, Cora and Admirable. I'm joined by the winner of the second semifinals, Tare. Congratulations for punching your ticket to the finals. Uh, how was that series for you going through your head? It seemed like you were pretty much on cruise control in terms of just being very calm and collected. Um, yeah, the series went um, pretty much as expected. Although the Warrior vs. Druid game, I pretty much had the perfect hand and I threw it, unfortunately. It happens, but I mean, at least you got over the, the biggest hump, which is getting to the finals. You could be yet another person who will repeat a performance at BlizzCon. Is there some key to your consistency right now? Um, not necessarily, but I mean, I've been playing for a while and I always try and improve and I think I have a lot of experience, so that definitely helps. And also, Hot Meowth mentioned that he thinks he has the best lineup and you have a very similar lineup, so we've you know, consequently said that you also have the best lineup. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. Dude's lineup was somewhat similar too, but basically just aggro decks and mid-range decks are really strong, I feel. And your control, Cthune Warrior? And my control, Cthune Warrior, yeah. It seems indestructible when you're able to stack that much armor despite the aggression. So congratulations, Tarei. You're going to the Grand Finals. You're going to take a quick break to rest for it. In the meantime, we're going to head over to the sidebar for some analysis and pre-show for the finals.